some participants are active in the morning and some of them are active <laughs> yeah true That's, yeah uh, sir you can start okay one minute sir so very good very good morning to all of you and uh, we are going to have the second day of this congress uh, so today also we have a lot of speakers uh, right from new zealand to united state of america and today also you will have some wonderful scientific events so the first talk of this session will be delivered by dr john v kennedy from new zealand uh, the, the session chair for this uh, talk will be professor kannadasan from center for nanotechnology research uh, i welcome dr kannadasan to just introduce the speaker so over to dr kannadasan thank you thank you dr raja uh, good day everyone of the world uh, i welcome all of you for the second day of world nano congress on advanced science and technology on behalf of our team center for nanotechnology research vit uh, Uh, every day we see changes in the life culture technology human has explored almost everything of universe in the last 1000 years before 1950 there was a belief and challenge amongst the athletes that no one can run a mile less than 4 minutes often referred as sub 4 minute mile it became a myth as many people tried again and again and failed there was a young neurologist in oxford england named roger banister with a minimal experience in the running as an athlete he broke the limit and completed the 4 miles sorry a mile in 3 minute 9 59 seconds after that day nearly 50000 people had broken the limit including high school kids not a single man it's about nearly 50000 people what changed the event changed the belief of human and just gave a knowledge that the uh, such a 4 mile uh, such a 4 minute mile is possible and such a stories would have been heard all the day in science people who cross such a barriers and limit uh, limits are named as legends the works of uh, and scientific contribution uh, they have given give us a motivation that we can make new significant contribution to the world our center for nanotechnology research group has identified such legendary researchers and gathered as world nano congress we humbly thank our director a nebula grace uh, for the inspiration and pillar for this event in the second day we have several speakers from new zealand to us across the world let the day uh, motivating and give confidence of possibility that break the barriers of our mind our honorable guest and speaker dr john v kennedy of gns science new zealand will start the first session of the day uh, dr john v kennedy is the uh, principal scientist and team leader of ion beam physics and nanotechnology at nano isotope center gns science as a material scientist he focused on condensed matter research uh, nuclear instrumentation he has pursued a wide range of research projects related to the applications of ion beam implantation and ion beam analysis technique for various applications of nanotechnology advanced materials biology environmental and agriculture dr john's research uh, interest is applying his material science to industrial projects which has led him to be leader in the product accelerator inductive uh, power transfer and titanium technologies of new zealand i welcome dr john uh, to the world nano congress and request him to deliver a talk on his research interest uh, for the world of for the um, world of the world of uh, nanotechnology uh, i request the audience to write the, their queries in the comment box and the speaker will address them at the end of the talk now i request dr john to take over the session thank you chair we have the sharing access now yep thank you chairman again 
Um, let me first thank Professor Nirmala Grace and the organizing team for inviting me for this talk. It's New Zealand and a beautiful country. It's evening 3.30 p.m. So um, for us, it's a summer, so the sun is still shining. That's the beauty of New Zealand. Um, today, uh, I thought I'll focus my talk more on connecting material science and the electronics and instrumentation um, since this uh, Congress is more on science and technology. So um, as Chairman said, my name is John um, Vedamuthu Kennedy. So um, I, I have a, a couple of affiliations. I work in the GNS Science, which is the New Zealand Crown Research Institute, which is the government energy research center. And I also uh, a principal investigator in McDermott Institute for Advanced Materials Nanotechnology, which is the center of research excellence in New Zealand. And I also a uh, principal investigator in the New Zealand products that I've had, which is the industry network where we work with 250 companies and mostly manufacturing companies to make a new product. So with that, I will go straight into um, focus on my presentations. So as I said earlier, today's presentations, I will give you some overview of what is acoustic wave resonators in context to mobile communication, how one can tune the materials parameters relevant for the um, bulk acoustic wave performance factors, then going in deep into how ion beam science and engineering helps to achieve the parameters required to improve the communications uh, equipments. Then I'll highlight some of the benefits of the strain engineering. As you all know, we all go crazy when internet speeds goes down. At the same time, we all need faster communications in mobiles and other communication devices. But then also when you have a more and more small components in the mobiles and everything, it gets hot. So we are always looking to see how to improve the energy efficiency of the communication devices, having a less parts consumes less energy as well. And if you uh, focus more down to mobile communications, and we started with the 2G, 3G, now we are moving to 4G to 5G, and, and there will be more than 5G coming out. Um, which is all related to the uh, uh, reliability of the data transfer. So uh, being a physics-based material scientist, we were trying to understand what can we do to improve the reliability of data transfer and also uh, uh, solve some of the uh, speed in the communications. If you look at the, uh, this is a crowded um, image. I just give you outline. This gives you the, um, VLF and high, high frequency, VHF, UHF, and short antenna waves, all supercritical level thing. This is where the shows where we moved from 2G to 5G plus. But for simplicity, this slide gives you a better idea. If you look at the mobile communications, um, today's mobile communication happens 4G band and 5G band, which is, um, um, not related to radio or phone communication. So if you see the uh, first blue region, which is where some of the bandwidth uh, um, initially works on the megahertz, but then when you go on more and more, more 5G and Wi-Fi routers, then the frequency start uh, going up. So when the frequency range, the bandwidth, even you have higher, you can transfer uh, um, a more amount of information. So this is, means you need a, a better uh, technology, a hardware, which can be inside the, your Wi-Fi router or mobile phone can do that. So one of the uh, common technologies used in these uh, frequency uh, resonator is the acoustic wave filter. So what it does is um, it's basically the resonance frequency is determined by the acoustic speed of the materials and that um, normally the materials are piezoelectric film and number of oscillations of that material. So when you go higher in speed, 
there are challenges comes in more about the acoustic losses and the sheet resistant and which later to the frequency as well if you see that curve you are um let you change your hose down when you go high in the frequency then you could layer thickness by one by f as well so this creates a lot of interesting opportunities for a material scientist to see how can we tune some of the piezoelectric materials properties to to enhance the um, I mean to reduce the sheet resistance loss and the acoustic loss, which will enhance the speed. So most likely, if you go to simple systems, currently most of them used called surface acoustic wave filter resonators. So that's the diagram there. You have a um, Interdigit diode electrodes, and, and that's currently um, done through piezoelectric materials. This is aluminum nitride and, and, and some glasses as well. So, this acoustic wave propagates along the surface. That's why it's called surface acoustic wave. But we have been working, looking at a bulk acoustic wave where it can propagate through the film thickness. So, this is uh, more suitable for uh, more than 5G technology applications. So, but in context to a material scientist like you and me, what does that mean? If we look at the bulk acoustic wave resonator performance, what is a key property affects that? So there is a term called figure of merit, um, which is, um, um, yeah, it's a complicated formula, but which is equal to the uh, piezoelectricity standard K33, which is, um, I mean, K squared EF, which is the thing. But if you go into more into the piezoelectric material, the key parameter actually determines the performance is D33. So this is the factor which if you can increase the D33, you can improve the bulk acoustic wave performance, which will later to the um, increasing uh, frequency. So the D33 parameter is normally related to the material strain. So that is, and uh, then, you, if you have a D3, then you have a e, I mean, epsilon is electric field, dielectric constant. Then you have a, um, um, this called KEF, which is like basically a, um, a resonance losses, actually. So there's a, quite a few, but the key factor is D33. So we have been looking to see how we can actually improve the D33 of the piezoelectric um, power filter. So one approach we come up is, can we really tune the stress by inducing a, a defects in the crystalline lattice through ion beam implantations? Then look at how these defects affect the unit still of the crystals. And also to investigate what sort of defects are required to improve the D33. So this is one of our recent work, which is just published in three high quality journals Active material and operate physics letters, and the other one operates of science. So this is just a way we demonstrated a new hypothesis of by tuning the crystal texture defects, you can actually improve the AT33. So as I said before, you need a piezoelectric material for the bar filter. It's mostly aluminum nitrate. So we looked at some of the aluminum nitrate um, uh, uh, thin films grown by MBE. They are around 100 nanometers, 250 nanometers. So they, we used MBE grown films and also PVD and MIMO CVD. So we looked at, I mean, we, we prepared samples by many techniques. So, and then we looked at the initial roughness. So we understand better about the crystal structures and the strain which comes in because one could also say that you can actually induce a strain during the growth of those films as well. But it depends on which lattice sites and also it sits in. That influences the, the frequency, which I will show you later. So, you, so far, people are trying to address this by changing the growth parameters and inducing a, some sort of stress and strain along the axis. But it is not good at to achieve the high frequencies more than um, uh, five gigahertz range. So we have been looking at this very carefully over the last two years. 
So in this case, um, I think some of you may not know what is ion implantation is. So ion implantation is a well-known technique used in the semiconductor industry or microelectronics industries to dope impurity ions to change the uh, functionality like electrical properties and optical properties, magnetic properties, many on. So what it does is, let's say you have aluminum nitrate um, uh, crystals and you one ion goes in and sits in um, as an impurity in the lattice sites and some of them goes in the vacancies. Depending on the instant ion energy, you can actually modify the surface, adobe them at certain depth. You can also determine what concentration ions you dope them as well. So that's the kind of uh, thing people do. How does it work? It works in a, a system like this in a, called ion implanter. And you have a basically ion source where you just ionize a, a gas bottle and produce a plasma. Let's say you take a, 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 a titanium, you have titanium plus, and you create the repurchase and you select the mass of the titanium ion you want to put into your samples. And it uh, uh, I mean, scans the ion beam in front of the samples, which means we are forcefully, forcefully injecting a, ions into the materials in the atomic scale. So that's why it is a very well technique, highly controllable technique used in microelectronics industry. We have been working this years and I started this and patented the unique device with our own device in 2011. We did quite a lot of work on this using for doping semiconductors and optical devices and magnetic devices. Then we also moved to quite a lot of nanoscale fabrication using these ion beams by nano clusters and so on. So that's, it's a well-known technique. Um, it's commercially available technique and you can do large scale um, four inch, five inch vapors for many devices. So we, um, this gives you a flexibility of um, adopting or incorporating any ions into a material. So coming back to this project, um, when you want to do an implantation, we have a, a, a simulation program, it's called trim simulation, which is basically a Monte Carlo simulation. If you see this case is a zirconium ion and, and we use a 30 kV ion beam and that le the left hand side shows what depth it goes in and how much concentration of zirconium goes in depending on the fluence number of atoms per centimeter squared we put in. So this is a kind of um, Monte Carlo simulation and which shows you how far we're implanting. But if you look a bit more on the defects involvement of the number of defects and atomic ratios in depth, you will see there are several regions where it's ups and down. So for example, rich um, A region is aluminum rich and B is nitrogen rich defects, then C is aluminum, zirconium rich. And so we get sectioned in several regions to focus to understand how the defect is varying. So if we go down, then we look at the um, um, annular dark field scanning transmission electron microscopy, which is called HAADF steam image, which is sensitive to atomic mass. So when you look at initially at the bottom of the material aluminum polar, which is red, and um, then nitrogen polarity is inverse again kind of blue. So this is actually quite good. You can see that those different regions, how the defect rich regions based on the zirconium implantation, uh, multiple polarity changes from one region to other regions when defect occurs. So this is really a high quality steam image to actually probe the defects and changes that um, uh, uh, and the regions where it changes the lattice and, and also the uh, defects occur in different parts of the lattices as well. This is, um, I mean, those days we simply do normal TEM, but these days you have uh, this kind of um, steam image with an um, angular deck uh, field, which is precisely gives you to each atomic layer, layer, then you can look at where the real defects happening, which is great because this is a high resolution way of understanding the defect later information uh, from the uh, crystal uh, uh, flames. So we looked at very closely then Obviously, we all do XRD. So we looked at the um, extra diffraction and tilt angle perspective. So if you look at that on the left-hand side, that um, the dashed line is basically corresponds to unstrained aluminum nitrate. Then 
and the block line corresponds to us received. But you can see as we starting to uh, implant zirconium, in this case into very low dope, 10 to 13 atoms or something. So you're talking about sub PPM or PPP. Then we are moving towards the PPM and you can, you're starting to see the strain because you see that um, there is no change in the A axis of strain up to 10 to 16. Um, and you're starting to see the broadening we call micro strain. Then when you go to 17, there is a clearly there's a, a micro strain because there's a shift, big shift on that. So if you look at the right hand side, which is the A axis, the left, left hand side C axis, you can the A axis, it's not a big shift until <coughs> you go to 17, which you are basically making it amorphous. But if you do a tiny uh, 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 fluence like 15, 13, 14, 16. The X, A axis lattice doesn't change much, but the C axis changes a lot. So we looked at more closely again to understand the, um, the strain level. Obviously you do Raman as well. So Raman, it will tell you the broadening, I mean, I mean, because crystal vibrations are much more sensitive to Raman. And if you look at more overall closely, this Raman is done in a 514 argon laser. So you can see that obviously when you do so much doping, uh, in plant, you obviously damage the crystals, which is a, um, a 17 and 16 like that. But if you do tiny amount, when you go 13, 14, you can actually shift the, the broadening luminous arm um, uh, uh, with that, uh, which corresponds to um, defect density. Um, obviously when you go, as I said before, when you go higher fluence, which means you already put too much ion, you damage the crystal lattice. These are all standard information you get from any lab. But then we had a closer look at with uh, based on synchrotron XAS um, data to, to understand the, um, um, to get some sort of insight to unoccupied metal states, which is normally happens due to hybridization of nitrogen in valence states. So you can see that reduced amplitude source in AL aluminum to nitrogen orbital along the C axis, um, which is similar to, um, uh, uh, XRD, larger spacing, then you see shift B and C indicates replacement of aluminum with zirconium. So you're starting to see that it's there is a polarity changes, which means you actually have a induced strain and you in a particular uh, um, a, a plane to alum, nitrogen uh, aluminum planar. So which is clear indication of that iron beam engineering is thus changes the induced stress and making shift in towards the lattices. So we dig um, deeper into this bit more specifically. We also had an aluminum polar wafer on the surface and nitrogen polar wafer. And we did a lot of work to understand the D33 on that. You can actually calculate the D33 uh, polarization using XRD data, which is um, uh, not many of you have done it because we always, take a simple XRD and say, oh, peak shift and this means changing that. But you can actually extract a lot of new information if you spend a bit more time and, and understand what is actually happening in the crystal lattice and so on. So you can, then we do a D33, we can also experimentally, so theoretically you can call it from the XRD data. Then experimentally we determine the piezoelectric force microscopy. <clears throat> which is proportional to the polarization along the C-axis. So then we plotted in, uh, implant of fluence, which is D33 uh, from the piezoelectric for microscopy. You can start to see that we can actually change significantly due to the in, um, uh, implantation fluence and, and the calculator value and, um, and also the measured value is reasonably matching to that. So this shows that there is additional information about the polarization which is later to the uh, stress uh, gradient can be also calculated from the XRD data as well. So we, we went on uh, focus a bit more deeper into many samples where we can change the um, strain gradient um, ratios and calculate the um, uh, DM, uh, uh, information from XRD data then compared with the um, um, PFM data, everything. What is interesting is that when you look at the right answer, if we 
only if we implant titanium zirconium hafnium, we are able to change the D3 deviation in the positive side. But if we go to titanium zirconium hafnium, we go into negative side. So that gives us interesting information why certain metal alone in enhancing the stress gradient significantly, the other metals are not. But that also related to the, uh, 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 the uh, polarity of the samples, either aluminum polar, nitrogen polar. So even if you take a relaxed samples, you can even tiny amount of the doping, we can strain engineer them that will increase the D33, uh, even um, our, um, order of magnitude. So we have been uh, um, looking at closely of each element like hafnium, titanium, and looking at the distribution, how this corresponds to the fluent and also the um, and T33. So this is, gives you a rough idea of um, overall information. Then when we look at the uh, defects in uh, steam image, which is, as I said, um, you can easily look at the distribution of defect area with ion beam simulations before, then now you compare with the actual measurement we do. So the steam image is, uh, image is showing is hydrostatic, uniaxial and biaxial cross-section film. This is from the um, uh, um, aluminum nitride. So the bright field steam images of, um, let's say sample A, implanted with the 10 power 15, and which is the number uh, A, then gives you um, kind of where the aluminum nitride then uniaxial and biaxial starts happening. If you close a look at it, and also if you um, compare with the Mandacola simulations, earlier we did, which is corresponding to region A and B. If you can, if you remember the selection of regions, my simulation diagram picture in the third, fourth slide, where we have, a, um, where we have a selected few regions where aluminum makes nitrogen trace. So that corresponds to here. We can compare this uh, significant increase in the changes of D33, which is amazing. We are able to directly, theoretically calculate the defects and extremely locate where the defects is going how it's changing, which is, you can imagine the scale bar, it's really high resolution team image. You're talking about nanometer less than a resolution. So that gives you the very good idea of the, how the lattices can change. Because the defects we are talking about is very minor. So um, moving on, we also looked at various uh, samples. So the reason we are not saying here, what is sample A, what is sample B, because of commercial reasons. We have a file pattern, it's went through already. So. So let's assume sample A and B in the, for commercial um, regions. And you can see we are able to, depending on the fluence, we are able to change the biaxial and uh, um, we, we use the even different biaxial substrate, hydrostatic, intensity, externalities. We are able to change kind of piezoelectric polarization from positive side to negative side, everything. So what it gives is that metal implantation causes two strain types. One is a hydrostatic strain by intrinsic defects, the uniaxial defects by extrinsic defects. So strain change is only beneficial for substrate with low biaxial strain because it doesn't change any of the other properties. It actually helps to propagate the waves because it's all about acoustic waves in a better way. So we, we did um, look at a bit more closely even if you have a various grown flames and various uh, conditions, can we really retain the piezoelectric modulus uh, significantly? And how stable it is? Because you're, the strain you're talking about is more interfaces and interface strain, uh, it's hard it depending on the subfra uh, subfra surface and the flames, how they're grown. So we did a, a detailed uh, long-term study to identify the degradation at the interface, which, it's amazingly, we found that it's up to certain times, it's stable, then goes down. That's why some of the, that's one of the reasons why some of the devices fail after some time. Because many people, when they're so excited, when they suddenly find a result, they cannot go on to prototyping that uh, and make a device. But in a real world now, you need to understand how st stable it is over the month and time and how long you can maintain the particular functionality you're creating it. So this case, we, the piezoelectric model, as we have been looking at it months and years, which now is almost years in a device and, and see how stable it is. 
So this is one of our recent results. Obviously, once we uh, file the patent, we uh, publish that paper, which I shown you before, APL and Actor Materialia. So what we did is then, all right, we got a demonstrator device. So we had um, made our own um, resonators um, in, um, and you can see the schematic in the left-hand side. The right-hand side is a real device, which is made of um, amine implant aluminum nitride, the strain materials. And then we have uh, two resonators, we are connecting them and, and we are looking at the frequency resonance up to 22.5 gigahertz. That gives us a really, really long frequency, which case 5G plus, or it's going to name it next plus. It can cope up with that, that kind of well brand bandwidth, bandwidth as well. So this clearly demonstrates there is a, a clear application for and beam strain engineering. In one case, as we demonstrated that you can improve the um, resonator's frequency for mobile communications. And we are also looking at the energy harvesters for variable electronics. And you can also do it some of the um, conductivity improvement, the transistors for CPUs. There are some groups looking at that way. Even there are some groups looking at the efficiency at the solar cells. So this is more on um, semiconductor-based solar cells. Even we also have other project. We're looking at um, applying, improving some of the mechanical properties of the uh, steel as well. So this kind of says even a simple uh, manipulation of materials, fundamental parameters of defects, and you can actually create a additional functionality of the material, and you can improve their lifetime and speed everything. So it's you don't have to even reinvent it again, making a new material by understanding the aluminum nitrile material inherent properties much better and try to identify where certain aspects can be slightly gently modified, attuned to improve the new properties. So that's a, a clear way of demonstrating how iron beam um, strain engineering can be applied. The beauty of this technique is it is a micro industry. So it's commercialized. So that instrumentations that are already every strain every micro, I mean, chip manufacturer are using it. So when you create a new idea, new um, intellectual property on this, the, the next value chain of commercialization is become easier because you know the market, you know who is the manufacturer. So that's the other additional um, benefit. If you are really successful developing a, 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 a recipe on making this device, it can get acceptable market very rapidly compared to other basic research we do, then we need to get a long time for some people, somebody to take up and manufacture, then demonstrate the market and so on. So that's a clear advantage of how this kind of unique functionality can be realized in a real world applications. With that, I'll summarize what we said so far. So we are able to correlate the relationship between XRD and polarization demonstrated, as you can see. Then we, the polarization of this tunable by and beam implantation, we have seen various regions, A, B, C, D, F, how the defects are changing into that. Then we also have shown clearly how the engineer defects can cause strain, with the improved polarization performance of the materials and different lattice structure, and also how compatible this to manufacturing and we looked at some of the manufacturing challenges in terms of the stability and the lifetime of these kind of devices. So imagine this is a kind of applied end of material science cannot be done by one lab. So we have a very strong, um, the most of the work I presented today is um, done by my postdoc for Holger and um, other scientists like Jerome we have a strong collaboration with um, Boston and Institute of Wollongong for TEM and um, um, STEAM images and Fern Harbor Institute for some of these um, debate related simulations. Then our key partner is the Singapore NTU and Professor Geek in groups where they do make the devices. Um, it's a huge devices lab. They make the devices for us to test this. So um, obviously this is, um, we do have a, a IP patent and, and subsequent um, publications are coming up 
in a very very high impact channels as well. So obviously it's not one person effect. I do have a, a strong team, and you can see there is a many people put a lot of effort into it in various aspects of the materials growth to the characterization and for this work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. John. That was a very wonderful uh, session. I request audience, please unmute yourself. Uh, if there is a question, please go ahead. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, so uh, I have a set of questions. Uh, Okay, so you have told about uh, you know, doping uh, certain metals like zirconium, titanium, and all. So if we do co-doping of these materials, what sort of effects will we can get? It's a good question. Again, it depends on the um, uh, amount of doping you do, and then depending on the uh, uh, which site it goes, whether it goes in interstitial lattice. So it's it's purely depending on the material, and on what you implant, what you dope as well. But it does. It can actually even, in, in context to stress, it can actually even create more stress because you are, um, uh, because each code of when you say one ion comes with a different valence, the other one comes with a different valence state. So you're starting to play around um, creating more defects into that as well. Okay, yeah, yeah. And uh, you talked about the resonators and how we can bias them to get such a high frequency signals for practical applications, particularly when so the device a... is... Sorry? Yeah, when the device is inside the IC, so how we can, uh, how we can get uh, signals out and how it will be useful for the uh, applications? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. I think it's a typically your instrumentation lab, you have a RF oscillators and you put one of one by F frequency into one side, Yes. And obviously you need a packaging. So these devices are nicely packaged and gives you that. Um, and the contact is, contact does play a bigger role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, definitely we, uh, there will be equivalent circuit uh, supposed to be uh, developed for this and supposed yep. to be integrated, I, yeah. Yeah, so all this, um, even, um, I typically a communication department has those kind of, um, meters on the RF amplifier and resonator testing unit. It's a simple unit like your Keithley. Yeah. yeah, that yeah. You can feed in, yeah. Okay. It's a, and uh, what about alternate substrates? Uh, we can go ahead with. So, I mean, it's, it, when you come to device, as you know, you'd have to be really high purity substrates because you don't want the impurities. So, so far the size, um, the yearly SAR devices even made up uh, glass, substrate, but that as, that's why they have a limit of frequency. Um, we can only go up to go three gigahertz, I believe, in the early SAR device. So when you go to the high frequency, that's why you need to go to high quality um, uh, materials like aluminum. It has to be a piezoelectric material. There's no doubt about that because you are talking about acoustic waves. So it has to have acoustic, one piece of electric is the best material for that. So these, these days, um, aluminum nitride is one of the most um, uh, best piece of electric materials um, for coming uh, context to the um, uh, conductivity and piece of electric polarization and also the easy to grow. And it's well, um, uh, very well established a growth technique available. So um, glass is another option. You can do some other aluminum dope nitrate like aluminum gallium nitrate, but so far the performance has to be found to be better for aluminum nitrate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John, uh, for a wonderful talk and, uh, and- Okay, I have one small quick question. Anyway, uh, John, uh, you have a nice presentation. So just I would like to you have look for any polymer containing samples, you know, the use of ion beam technique for the polymers. Yeah, so we are we have been looking at some of the PV, um, PVDF and also even uh, P, uh, PE uh, layer samples. And um, yes, if you have in 10 power 13 ion fluence, the damage is really low, which is good. But you can't okay. put more than 10 power 13 atoms per centimeter square. Okay, okay, okay. Samples. okay, because some people have some reports are there, based on our experience. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah. Anyway, thank you very so much for the nice presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Reddy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Nice to see you after 20 years, you know. Great. <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, Grace here. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation and uh, thank you for accepting the invite and uh, uh, raising the occasion. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, all. Thank you. Bye. Uh, Dr. Kaurush, uh, uh, good morning. So uh, I think we can uh, continue and we can start your session. So uh, on behalf of uh, CNR VAT, uh, welcome you, Dr. Kaurush, and uh, thank you for accepting this invitation. So uh, Dr. Kanadasan will be chairing your session. He'll be introducing you to the participants. Followed by that, we'll have your presentation. So uh, thank you once again. Uh, over to Dr. Kanna. Yeah, uh, thank you, ma'am. We had a wonderful uh, talk by Dr. John Kennedy. Our uh, next speaker of the day is Dr. Kaurus Kalantar Zaid of Australia. Dr. Zaid is a professor of chemical engineering at University of New South Wales, Australia. Dr. Zaid is one of the Australian Research Council Laureate Fellows of 2018. He is involved in uh, several research uh, uh, domains such as material science, electronics, and sensors. He has co-authored more than uh, 450 uh, scientific papers and also a member of editorial boards of various uh, prestigious journals such as ACS Nano, ACS Sensors, and ACS Applied Nanomaterials, and so on. Uh, he has received uh, many international awards, including 2017 Institute of uh, Electrical and Electronics, that is IEEE Sensor Council uh, Achievement, 2018 American Chemical Society, advances in measurement science leadership uh, lectureship awards and 2020 uh, robert boyle uh, our uh, prize of royal society of chemistry he also appeared in uh, the uh, uh, clavative uh, yeah clavid uh, analytics most highly cited list in 2018 on behalf of our organizing team of World Nano Congress, I request Dr. Zay to take over the session. You are muted, Dr. Kroos. All right, I'm here. Yeah, perfect. And let me share. Uh, are you able to see the presentation? Yeah, we are able to see the presentation. All right, let me go to the first page. Okay, so thanks for the, thanks for the invitation and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I suppose I have half an hour and I start now. Uh, the talk about the talk today is about neglected reaction media for synthesizing functional materials using liquid metals. Uh, so what are these liquid metals? Basically, uh, we have very famous mercury, and then we have francium, cesium, gallium, rubidium, that are metals, uh, and also hold a liquid phase state at room temperature or near room temperature. They are fluid, they are flexible, they can alloy and mix with other metals, they have high thermal and electrical conductivity. Mercury and gallium are suitable for functional applications because francium is radioactive and uh, cesium and rubidium are explosive. Mercury is highly toxic, so uh, gallium remains out of all these elements. And if you talk about a single element, establishing a field around one single element is very limiting. So we cheated, we said, okay, we put all transition, post-transition metals, which are indium, tin, lead, thallium, and bismuth and that have melting point less than 330 degrees into one basket and may use them and define them as a liquid metals. Why 330 is a good number because it's a kind of temperature that you have access in, in any kitchen. Basically you can do all the processes for these liquid metals at relatively low temperature. Let's go back to the representative of this group, gallium. Gallium melting point is 30 degrees. Basically, you put a piece of gallium at the palm of your hand, it melts. Gallium can alloy with other metals, like indium, zinc, bismuth, and tin at very high concentration and make very interesting alloys 
even entropy goes higher and the melting point goes lower. For instance, E gain, 75% gallium, 25% indium, has a melting point of 15.7 degrees. Now, gallium has other interesting properties that mercury, for instance, doesn't have. Gallium at ambient oxygen, 21% oxygen, produces a self-limiting oxide on its surface. This oxide becomes only one or two nanometers and it stops and it protects the bulk of the gallium from further oxidation. Uh, it's a two-dimensional material, very similar to graphene. It's very strong across the uh, two dimension. What does it mean? That means it can hold it together. You can print the small droplets of liquid metal on the top of each other. As you see, it's a 3D print. You can up and up and up and make 3D objects. But before it collapses, you can make this kind of prints. It's a non, uh, non Newtonian rheological real characteristics that it offers this two dimensional skin. Can we see the skin? Yes. Take one of the droplets of gallium, start shaking it, the skin breaks, the skin comes off the surface, and these uh, layers that come off the surface that can be stacked on top of each other. But the most important thing, as you see, in H, you, you start uh, shaking it, you see the wrinkles, very similar to graphene, molybdenum, disulfide, all two dimensional materials, it wrinkles because it's very thin. Now I'm talking about different properties. First of all, I talk about non-crystalline nanoparticles. So look, uh, it's a liquid. We start sonicating it, very similar when you have uh, oil and vinegar. They don't, they're immiscible. You start shaking them together and uh, you, you produce, for instance, droplets of oil into water or vinegar. Here it's the same as well. If you put a drop, a big drop of liquid metal into, for instance, water, so shaking it, it breaks down. But here there is a big difference between oil and liquid metal. And liquid metal produces that skin, that the skin stabilizes the small liquid droplets. And you can make this liquid droplet smaller, 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 smaller when you shake it longer. So we, we, we can then have this very high surface to volume ratio droplets that you make films from and you can use it for a different application for instance here we use them for making functional materials for sensing this is a, a stripping voltammetry you apply voltage for instance you want to detect cadmium or lead in the water you apply voltage this cadmium and lead ions go and amalgam into gallium, and then you reverse the voltage to come out, you measure the current, and current is proportional to the concentration of heavy metal ion in the environment. We're talking about rest, heterostructures. Look at this, this is a droplet of liquid metal a schematic. The liquid metal droplet, very interestingly, is a liquid metal, but on the surface it's layered. Uh, the gallium, Elements on the surface become very highly ordered. Tin element on the surface become very highly ordered. And if it's exposed to uh, the ambient oxygen, it produces very ordered uh, oxide of that metal. So what does it mean? Let's go to the famous two-dimensional material. We want to synthesize where two-dimensional material. Uh, for years and years, people have been trying to make these semiconducting two-dimensional materials or graphene using CVD, uh, chemical vapor deposition, molecular beam epitaxy, ALD. Especially CVD is uh, a very favorable one because you can do it at low costs in comparison to MBA, MB and ALD. But the problem of CVD, for instance, is uh, when, for instance, you look at uh, depositing a 2D material, semiconducting, you produce grains that come from the nucleation at the center. The nucleation at the center is thick. Grains, uh, they appear everywhere. And for instance, you have triangular growth here for molybdenum disulfide. They grow on the top of each other, or do a stitching. So if you want to make semiconducting material, electrons or holes go from one side to another, they scatter. This is a very bad, material. Uh, 
When we're talking about the oxidation that happened naturally for liquid metals on the surface of liquid metals, the Mott Cabrera oxidation, that means everything oxidizes at the same time. You don't get any grain boundaries. So if you have gallium, indium, bismuth, tin, they have low melting point. You melt them on the surface, you produce the oxide. You bring a substrate very close to the surface, you touch the surface. On one side, this uh, two dimensional material doesn't attach to liquid metals. On the other side, it can easily attach to the substrate and you harvest it. So, this is a liquid metal example. It's a tin, it's not self limiting in ambient, it becomes thicker and thicker in 21% oxygen ambient. And as you see, you can take a piece of glass, the 2D material on the surface sticks to the piece of glass as the oxide of tin, tin oxide. So it becomes thicker and thicker and thicker, the color changes. The moment that you harvest it, you get the <coughs> second layer. So as you see, the moment you harvest it, this area becomes yellow because it produces very thin layer of tin oxide again. Yeah? Now, you control the ambient oxygen, for instance, instead of 21%, you reduce it to 0.5%. It becomes self-limiting for tin as well. Tin melts at 230 degrees. You just heat it about 250, you melt it, then you bring the substrate and you touch tin and you harvest it again and again and again. And you make very controlled uh, thickness tin oxide on the surface of the substrate and you can repeat it. It's very interesting, uh, other tin oxide or other materials, for instance, this is the example of gallium oxide. We harvest gallium oxide on the surface. You can use gallium oxide directly for making transistors. Gallium oxide can be used for high power transistors, or you can do the second step processing. Here we expose it to a precursor of nitrogen, like urea, at very high temperature. Then we produce gallium nitride. As you may know, gallium nitride is a very famous semiconductor for making blue LEDs, that's it. Blue LEDs, which is used in low energy lamps all over the world because the mobility is very high, 20 centimeter per volt uh, second. Band gap is three and a half. This is actually a very high quality material. We can make LEDs. Uh, it's commercially now uh, under usage. Another one which is going towards commercialization is making ITO glass. If you look at mobile phones, or your uh, display of your laptop, your monitor. Many of them, uh, they have transparent conductive material as electrodes because we want to see through. It's made of indium and tin oxide, but indium and tin are elements of post-transition metals. Now, how do we do it as a melting process? We can melt them together at 200 degrees because when you mix them, the melting point goes down. Here we use a squeeze printing. That means uh, we uh, squeeze the melt between two substrates and it's quite transparent. Liquid melt goes out, two dimensional materials remain on each side. And as you see, you can make one layer of ITO, and then you can also print it for the second layer, third layer. Here are the, are the examples. When we have one layer, we have 99% transparency, two layers, 98% transparency, 99.2% transparency, just fantastic. Um, the other thing is, is to the mesh materials, you can bend it forever without breaking it, very similar to graphene. Graphene can be bent again and again and again, as you see, it doesn't lose its conductivity. And more importantly, when you deposit two, three layers of this ITO on the top of each other, it's very conductive. It's as conductive as commercial ITO glasses. Imagine now you have access to a conductive transparent glass, which is super flexible and super transparent. It's actually going to under commercialization as well. Now, can we make other materials, synthesis other materials as well on the surface of liquid metal? Yes. It's very interesting. If we start with a few precursors, such as methanol, ethanol, as a propanol, organic materials, acetone, acetone nitrile that have nitrogen in it, and we put it in an electrochemical setup with liquid metal as one of the electrodes. We apply a voltage, we make the environment slightly acidic, and we see what happens on the surface. 
For the prediction, we have done DFT, density functional theory calculation, and I showed that if we use only gallium, not much happens. But if we have a fuel with electrolyte, and we add a little bit of tin or indium, then we have a dehydro dissociation of CH bonds, dehydrogenation happen, and dehydrogenation happens. And if you have tin and indium together with gallium, this happens more efficiently. And on the other side, we have also radicals of uh, after dehydrogenation. Radicals which are produced can penetrate and then form CC bonds into the liquid metal. And the bonds make it bigger and bigger, the entity. And this entity cannot remain dissolved and come to the surface. So very interesting reaction media. Here's a, if you don't have a fuel, as you see, uh, after a few minutes, liquid metal deforms, but nothing is formed on the surface. Here, you apply voltage, you have graphitic material, which is formed on the surface. So it's graphitic material templates on the surface of liquid metal is two dimension. But what type of two dimension material we're creating when we are deforming liquid metal in the process? We did Raman, for instance, uh, characterization, as you see, the Raman bands, D and G bands are very broad. Well, and we look at TM, zoomed in, zoomed in, zoomed in, we realize that because we have this elongation and deformation, we don't uh, create perfect graphene materials. Instead, we are producing islands of, of graphitic materials, nanographene, which is very useful for many applications. For instance, making battery electrodes, which is fantastic, it's holy graphene. But if you wanted to also to make perfect graphene, we had a solution for that. We just paint the liquid metal on the surface of copper or any other metal. You apply the voltage, it forms, but it doesn't deform the surface. And because of uh, 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 the electrophoresis, it can attach itself and go to the other side and it lands itself on uh, the substrate that you want to. It's a perfect uh, uh, graphitic material, actually. It's a very highly crystalline graphene oxide. And if, interestingly, if you use uh, the fuel that includes nitrogen, you get nitrogen uh, included graphitic material. Uh, as you may know, uh, uh, graphene with uh, added nitrogen, doped nitrogen, graphene has a very strong catalytic property. If you go back to liquid metal, we talk about the surface. How about the core of liquid metal? It's a sole. It's a solvent, very similar to water that we can put sugar or salt into water and supersaturate it, then evaporate, evaporize water and see the crystals of sugar and salt coming out. Here we can do the same thing. We can do crystallization, creation of crystals. Okay, look at one of the examples here. Here, uh, the example is about tin and is about uh, indium. We basically put tin, and indium into gallium. And uh, we, we know that something is formed if we supersaturate in, uh, the, uh, the inside of gallium by one of these elements. The problem is the surface tension of liquid metal is very high. How to take them out? So one of the ways of breaking the surface tension is to apply a voltage. Uh, applying a voltage against the surface, bring the surface tension to almost zero. Then you apply the reverse voltage, you can just push everything, all these nanomaterials that you create inside this liquid metal and bring it to the surface and let them really get released to the solution. Look at this one. Here is the example for tin. Tin nanoparticles coming out. And this is the example for indium. Indium particles come out as well, but there is a difference between indium and tin. One of them templates onto the surface of them come as nanoparticles. The nanoparticles, as you see, make the environment very cloudy, like milky shape. But here they come up as sheets, which are black. And these sheets are relatively large in size. Okay, here is the characterization for instance, the example of indium, uh, example of tin. Tin nanoparticles come out with the oxide of tin oxide around the surface, tin monoxide. 
interestingly, if you put indium or zinc into the example, uh, zinc plates come out because they template onto the surface. The surface media, when we apply a voltage, changes its uh, thermodynamics, zinc templates onto the surface and come out. So here we have a method that we can make metal oxides or metal out of liquid metal and then extract them by right, breaking down the surface. What are the applications of these manipulations? Look at one of these very beautiful applications here. We add a cerium at 3% to liquid metal and we supersaturate it because the uh, solubility of cerium into liquid metal is relatively low. It's only 0.1%. Here we added 3%. So what it did, it starts forming crystals of cerium into liquid metal. And if you, for instance, sonicate this liquid metal together with cerium particles and then take it to TEM, actually with high resolution TEM, you can see the areas which have are liquid metal or amorphous cerium oxide that come to the surface are amorphous. You don't see any crystal entity because we see beautiful crystal, crystals of cerium inside. So it's very interesting, very similar, as I said, like water that we can uh, create. Uh, crystals of salt and sugar. We can here create the crystals of metallic element using liquid metals. Now, what are the applications? Here is a very interesting cute application. We use one of the droplets of cerium oxide, cerium inside, connected it to a, an electrode. We put everything in electrolyte, started to bubble CO2 into the environment. We apply the voltage. Everything was in a cyclic process and it was reversible. CO2 to come to the surface, it produces oxygen and produces the carbon. Carbon sheets plate on the surface, and the surface is liquid metal, it doesn't attach to liquid, it comes off. So the process continues, continues, continues. If you use a solid electrode, it cocks the surface just after 10, 5 minutes, it doesn't continue. Onset voltage is really low point, minus 0.3 volts, and the Friday efficiency is high, 80%. It shows how interesting this process is, and it opens up a new world to us. The world that the electrode can, does not to be solid. The electrode for conversion of CO2 can be liquid, and it opens up, as I said, the world that we can have the byproduct as a solid byproduct of this conversion. It doesn't need to be a gaseous or liquid uh, uh, byproduct. Phase separation, here we are going as an interesting example inside, uh, to look inside liquid metal. This is like a classical metallurgy with the flavor of nanotechnology. Look, we, for instance, can add bismuth and tin at different ratios here, we said 0.8, 0.8, uh, 4.2, only bismuth, only tin. Bismuth and tin melting point of 232 and 278, 71. But when you mix them together, this melting point goes down. In eutectic melting point, which has the highest entropy, at 57% bismuth and the rest tin, you get the lowest melting point of 139 because entropy is the highest. And if you sonicate it, you can make this nanoparticles of bismuth tin, and we look at it. Now, if you just you shake it a little bit and uh, make larger droplets, millimeter droplets, and you open them up, you see very interesting properties and structures. You have lots of tin and 20% bismuth. You see these oceans of tin crystal at the background, and you have rods, very well uh, uh, organized rods of bismuth. Uh, Crisscrossing them. Then we have 20% tin and 80% bismuth. Then we have planes of bismuth and tin crisscrossing each other, and they are highly crystalline plane. Very interestingly, when we go to the eutectic system of 43% tin and 57% bismuth, the entropy of the system goes high and higher as a eutectic system. When you cool it down, they cannot make ordered crystalline, they become disordered crystalline, and like fibrous structures. Now, which one is good for what? Here, what we did, we went to uh, compare them 
for catalytic for the catalytic properties. We sonicated them uh, and we uh, characterize the properties of these materials. When you uh, sonicate them, it's in the liquid on the surface, you produce tin oxide, tin uh, dioxide, and bismuth oxide. And very interestingly, if you don't sonicate them, you only produce tin oxide. So it changes the uh, thermodynamic of the surface. When you sonicate them uh, and you take the system, you get lots of defects, edge dislocations, and boundaries. You don't have this much concentration of uh, this kind of defects while you're using non-eutectic mixes. So what does it mean? Here, we use those nanomaterials produced and take them for very traditional CO2 reduction reaction conversion, right? So this is for the formation of formate. We put everything, we apply the voltage for our day efficiency 78%. Voltage is actually very good at only minus 1.1 volt. And we realize that for most of the voltages, you take the system as the best conversion efficiency for formate. Why? Because if you may remember, that we have the highest number of surface and line defects, edge dislocations and boundary. Now you can do other cute things with uh, liquid metals. For instance, another example, we made a metallic foam, with the metal oxide, functional metal oxide on the surface. How did we do that? Here the example is not a liquid metal, it's called Fields Metal. Fields Metal melting point is 61 degrees. It contains 50% indium, 32% bismuth, 16% tin. You mix them together, it's eutectic. And very interestingly, we mix, mix everything in sodium bicarbonate, as you know, it's used for making uh, bread or cooking cakes, baking cakes. So we uh, put everything in acid. Acid interacts with sodium bicarbonate and produce CO2, CO2 very quickly forms this structure, but at the same time, it increases the temperature as well. It melts and the corners of these droplets stick to each other. So we have a very interesting foam. At the same time, we have the formation of functional metal oxide on the surface. So here it is how it works. You put a different concentration of acid. If acid concentration is only one mole, forming happens, 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 happens very gradually. If the acid concentration is high, the forming happens very rapid. This is 10 mole. So very from a very small droplet, you get this foam that covers the whole beaker. Okay, then uh, we characterize the foam, depends on the acidity that we use, depending on the formulation. We can have three layers, two layers, one metallic core and functional layers on the top. And we use them for photocatalysis as functional materials, uh, CO2 electric conversion, and bacterial electrofiltration. So basically it's a metallic form. You apply a uh, voltage to it each time at very low voltage actually before you have the hydrogen production, uh, electrolysis of the water. You can uh, get rid of 45% of bacteria and you can just do it a few times in series without uh, electrolysis and in a very safe condition. Here are the other examples. We only did this for bismuth and tin because indium is very expensive. You want to avoid it. We had only 1% indium and still we get this forming effect. Very beautiful forming, very beautiful separation of bismuth and tin. A fantastic material to look at. And also look at this beautiful indium formation on the surface. It's like Star Wars Planet of Death. And eventually, I'm going to uh, finish the talk with this example that, look, you can do everything basically at low temperature at the kitchen, at home. Here is a, a fizz metal. Here is, for instance, you add silver at different concentrations, put the field metal, you adjust the formulation of field metal a little bit. Then you can make the material as an electrocatalytic or photocatalytic material. Selective to different dyes. So we can make it selective to reducing different pollutants. Very easy, without any high-tech process, you can do this. So I want to finish the talk 
with this note that this is liquid metal word of low temperature processing of liquid metals. Basically, we can think of making many functional materials. We can think of using this and considering this liquid metal as water, as equal solvent, as organic solvent. But the difference is you can dissolve metallic elements into liquid metals and then mix them together inside the liquid metal and extract them. So it is offering you a new world, uh, a new world that you can make metallic compounds or metal oxide compounds, metal sulfide compounds, something that at our hands, but generally we haven't looked at it like this. So it's a good idea if you start entering this field and uh, give it a try. It's very rewarding because with very low investment, you can obtain very interesting uh, outcomes. So I finished the talk thanking my group members in the past and current group, group members, my colleagues at the University of New South Wales and RMIT University, and also my uh, colleagues internationally at UCLA and uh, uh, North Carolina, Carolina State University. I also have to thank uh, the grant providers at ARC Australian Research Council and also University of New South Wales. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zaid. Uh, that was a very wonderful uh, talk uh, going from uh, various uh, applications uh, in, means, in views of uh, metal, uh, liquid metals. Actually, uh, in fact, uh, I wonder in childhood, we see mercury as the only option. Uh, you, it's now we have so many metals. Uh, and uh, as a general question, uh, uh, we have a uh, questions like, uh, what about the abundance of these uh, liquid metals in the uh, world, in the earth coast? The abundance. Say it again, Say it again. I, I couldn't hear you properly, sorry. Uh, what about the abundance of these liquid metals? In uh, the abundance, yeah, that's a very good question. Look, uh, uh, everyone says, okay, indium is expensive and it is, gallium, is relatively expensive, but is mildly abundant. So the problem of gallium is you can find it everywhere. The extraction of gallium is expensive. It's about $280 per kilogram. But bismuth is relatively cheap, but tin is extremely cheap. This is why I included tin. Tin uh, melts at 230 degrees. It's 10 cents, 8 cents per kilogram can find it everywhere. So you can use tin as base and do all these processes if you think that you don't have access to gallium or indium. Yeah, uh, we, we got some questions from audience. I will uh, read them. Uh, sure. What is the value of carbon from uh, CO2? Is this thing valuable of CO2 utilization? Look, the biggest problem we have is this CO2 production is going on and on and on. And if it continues another five, 10 years, we all, we, all of us will be cooked because of the greenhouse gas, right? <laughs> the, the climate changes, this is about climate change. This is about taking CO2 out of the environment, out of the atmosphere, and be able to take the byproduct and do something with it or take this out. If the byproduct is liquid or gas, and it's going to be very difficult to store it again as a gas. If it's liquid, apparently every single method that we have for this conversion at the moment is extremely expensive. We're talking about ton of CO2 conversion and capture that we have to do everything under $50. The, with the process of liquid metal, we can do it. At the moment, there is no other process that can viable liquid metal conversion and capture process. So this is for saving human being from a very near future catastrophe. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Uh, can you comment on use of uh, liquid metal in magneto hydrodynamics and the uh, role of nanotechnology in enhancing such metallic properties? Okay, look, I'm not very familiar with magneto hydrodynamics, right? So I cannot give you much information about it. But I have to tell you that we have a few publications with uh, liquid metal with, that we added magnetic materials into this. And depends on the type of magnetic materials you can create. 
different types of magnetic liquids. One, and about the role of nanotechnology in enhancing, enhancing metallic properties. Yes, if you use nanomaterials, right? If you don't use micro or submicro magnetic material, they move when you put a magnet. They move from one side to another, right? If this nanomaterial, magnetic nanomaterials become smaller and smaller, they remain in suspension. So they make the whole liquid magnetic. So there is a big difference if you use some micron or, uh, uh, or micron uh, 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 magnetic materials or nano size material in the property of the uh, magnetic liquid metal. Oh, good. Uh, we have another uh, good question. Like, uh, how, uh, how can we reuse these uh, liquid metal alloys? OK. It depends on what you mean by reusing it. Look, we make them, right? Uh, uh, for instance, you saw that uh, for gallium, we just add a tin into gallium and we apply voltage and tin oxide or tin nanoparticles come out. Gallium doesn't change property. You can just add more and more and more uh, tin into this, right? It, it's a solvent. So that's it. It's not consumed or CO2 conversion is not consumed, right? So we use them, we use them again and again and again. It depends on what you're doing, right? Of course, if you want to use the, uh, synthesize something from gallium, then it's a different uh, uh, kind of question, different kind of story. Uh, uh, we have a, another question in connection to this CO2. Um, the question is, uh, what do you produce, graphite or amorphous form of carbon? We did both. If we used uh, a liquid metal, which could deform, uh, we could use something, we don't call it amorphous, we call, we call this here holy graphene, right? Mm -hmm. Holy graphene sheets. It's, it's made of small graphene sheets connected to each other, full of holes. But it's considered amorphous because when you look at the raw money, it has the signatures of amorphous raw for, for uh, graphitic material. Yeah, if you uh, then deposit this on a liquid metal, uh, which is painted on a solid uh, electrode, it cannot deform. And then you can get very perfect graphitic material. The most important thing is the synthesis of this graphitic material, right? Either graphite or amorphous graphene, uh, amorphous uh, uh, graphitic material is at room temperature. It's one of the lowest energy uh, uh, processes that can be done, that can be applied to obtain graphene at room temperature. There is no other example, basically. Yeah, uh, Dr. Raja. Yeah. Good afternoon, Dr. Gross. Uh, it was a nice talk. Uh, when you just formed this uh, 2D material based on this liquid metal, such as tin oxide and then gallium nitrate, what's the thickness of that uh, 2D material? Oh, you can go to the fundamental thickness. You're talking about, for instance, molybdenum. If, if you use it for templating and you produce molybdenum disulfide, you can go down to a, a point, point 0.7. Gallium nitride, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 nanometers. Uh, graphene, the thickness of graphene, one single layer of graph. Yeah, anything single layer you can obtain. But you just form liquid metal and then you just press it. Uh, can it? Uh, we form something like a monolayer. Uh... Look, that, for instance, for gallium oxide, a monolayer or bilayer, it depends on which one is more stable. It's formed uh, naturally on the surface and you just harvest it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zaid. Uh, it was a very wonderful presentation and you answered for many queries. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you once again, Dr. Karosh, uh, for the wonderful talk. Uh, see you in another occasion. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Andrew, uh, very good morning. Yes, good morning, Dr. Uh, yeah. uh, Nomala. Thanks. Thanks yeah, for your invitation. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, Dr. Andrew, can we just, uh, I mean, uh, leave this link and join back after uh, 10 minutes? Okay, I, I just test, but I can share the screen first. Yeah, yeah, we can test it. Yeah, okay, sure. Is, does that work?
Yes, it's perfect. Okay, perfect. right. Yes. Okay, we can take yeah. a ten minute break. Yeah, your session is exactly at nine thirty, and uh, it's nine twenty here. Yes. So we'll give audience a break, and then we'll rejoin the same. Okay, day. sure. I'll be Thank here. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah.